Welcome back to Munchausen's Proxy, where we once more take up the question, is Bob Iger retarded? In this installment, we examine the state of Disney's Marvel, which is timely given the earnings call the CEO of the Walt Disney Company had with analysts at the beginning of February. In that call, Bob Iger doled out the same platitude he has been shoveling at investors and analysts for three years now first starting in 2022 when he returned to Disney as CEO. Upon his return, he promised to calm down the culture war rhetoric, and then a few breaths later said the exact opposite. The next year, he said they would get out of the culture war and get back to making quality films and shows over pumping out quantity. And again this year, he promised the same. Now, there is the possibility that he was telling the truth all three times. I know, that is a shocking admission coming from someone who takes delight in raking Disney over the coals. However, it is possible, however unlikely. It takes a long time to stop the momentum of an organization like Disney which is why it has been the general consensus among commentators on pop culture that Disney would be the last of the Hollywood studios to reverse course on their adherence to the woke agenda, including acceptance of DEI and ESG. Possible, however, is not likely. Yes, it takes two to five years for a project to be completed from the start of pre-production to release which means Disney could very well have changed course and we won't know about it until two to five years from now, or rather from 2022. Hints out of the subject under study in this video show such might be the case. Captain America New World Order was changed to Captain America Brave New World. Shortly thereafter, they screen tested the movie and had a panic attack when the heavily politically themed movie was trashed by test audiences. Rumors had the script leaning heavily into January 6th analogies and various other leftist favorites. When the test screening results reached the executive suites at Disney and Marvel, reshoots were ordered. Extensive reshoots. Rumor has it that they are basically reshooting the entire movie after firing the writers and bringing in new scribes to pen something that has a chance of making money. Even before that, Daredevil was scheduled to hit Disney Plus before the end of 2023. When the writers and actors strikes hit, apparently somebody at Disney decided they had time to look at the 8 or 9 episodes of the 18 they were filming for Daredevil Born Again. Why do I say it like that? Because during the strikes, Disney Marvel suddenly fired the showrunner, directors, and writers, trashed the already filmed episodes, and started over with the Netflix Punisher series showrunner as the new boss for the show. These are not the actions of a company plying full steam ahead into Mount Woke. These are the actions of people who think they are on the Titanic and have decided to get off the ship before it hits the iceberg. But that is what they have been up to lately. What about Disney Marvel displays the retardation of Bob Iger? Bob Iger was rather smart to buy Marvel when he did. They had just hit big with Iron Man the year before, following it up with the less than successful The Incredible Hulk later that spring of 2008. There was the beginnings of a cinematic universe sprouting but it was not yet the box office juggernaut it would become a few years later. And when Disney completed the acquisition, they let Marvel do its thing without much interference. But this was pre-Kevin Feige as president of Marvel. Feige did not become head of Marvel until around the release of Captain America Civil War, when he executed a palace coup on Ike Perlmutter, the former boss at Marvel. And that is where the retardation of Bob Iger steps into the Marvel picture. Without Bob Iger's backing, Kevin Feige is fired by Ike Perlmutter and things at Disney Marvel continue chugging along like a printing press at the National Mint. For more thorough look at Marvel, 
I have two videos linked in the description that go over what is wrong and how I would fix it. Bob Iger's backing of Kevin Feige was the beginning of the end of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Feige, mixed with Iger's zeal for starting and maintaining Disney+, Plus, would bring us to where we are today, mere months on from the detonation of the Marvels at the box office. Hints of what was to come would start to appear in Marvel films starting with Thor Ragnarok. The director of Thor Dark World, Alan Taylor, refused to return for Ragnarok due to the fact that his creative freedom as the director ended rather abruptly the second he finished shooting the second Thor movie. It was then turned into an entirely different movie in the editor's bay, according to Taylor. So Marvel cast about for a new director for the third movie. Among a host of others, Taika Waititi made a list Marvel had for the slot. Apparently, Waititi had put together a clip montage set to a Led Zeppelin song to use as his pitch to Marvel, and Feige was sold. Shortly thereafter, his girlfriend Tessa Thomas was cast as Valkyrie, and the tone of the movie was set as a jokey movie into which they threw every idea that was brought up, with the possible exception of having Beta Ray Bill in the film. To be fair, Ragnarok made a lot of money on a reasonable budget compared to what Marvel shells out for their movies these days. And on first watch, I kind of liked it too. Not as much as the first or second, but it was okay. Black Panther, the next film to be released, was a mediocre film carried by the charisma of Chadwick Boseman and the popularity of Michael B. Jordan. The latter of which I will never understand, but that is a subject for another video that someone else will do. Anyway, while Bozeman was much better in Civil War, he embodied T'Challa, making the role his own and thereby pushing the film farther than it would have gone. Add to that a marketing strategy by Disney Marvel that was at once brilliantly manipulative and wildly and firmly in the camp of race hustling in an era that was building up to the summer of love in 2020, and of course the movie made a billion dollars. That anything other than technical awards were lavished on Black Panther was mildly ridiculous, just as it was even more so for the patently terrible Wakanda Forever. Black Panther, however, was a necessary movie to make as it helped set the foundations on Earth for Avengers Infinity War in a similar fashion to how Thor Ragnarok set the foundation for the beginning of the end in the cosmic side of the MCU. Avengers Infinity War was the high point of the MCU. The movie was engaging with stakes that hit home, with those who had been following the characters populating the Marvel Cinematic Universe for over a decade. And it was the last movie of the MCU that would not be hampered by studio politics and interference. At least not the kind visible to the audience. Infinity War was a smash hit, ensuring that every film between it and its conclusion in Avengers Endgame would also do well. And Disney Marvel played that up. Next up was the least popular of the mini franchises within the MCU, Ant-Man. Ant-Man and the Wasp was the first overt march into what would become known as the MCU. Scott Lang's Ant-Man became a passenger in his own movie, as he was upstaged by both his girlfriend and the diverse female villain aptly named Ghost, because nobody could remember her once the credits rolled. Which is slightly sad because she was played by the excellent Hannah John Kamen. Ant-Man 2 shoved the titular character to the side, making him the butt of most of the overjoked script, while also not being particularly good. However, it still made a profit heading into Endgame, without leaning on that upcoming movie like a crutch. Captain Marvel, however, shamelessly crutched its way into theaters on a marketing campaign that all but told audiences that they had to watch this movie to understand Endgame. Of course, that wound up being a lie. Captain Marvel was not a good movie. Captain Marvel was not even a mediocre movie. 
The star, Brie Larson, showed herself to be an unlikable person in real life and a sexless plank of wood on screen. Her character was awesome and only got awesomer as she finally realized her awesomeness that others, read men, tried to suppress. There was no point in the movie where you thought there was a chance the villains would win. And in fact, the villains weren't really the villains, as Marvel used one of the more evil races in Marvel Comics as an immigration allegory, turning the villains into sympathetic characters the hero saves. This is a habit of Disney in recent years, where they have felt the need to make villains sympathetic, rather than villains. It is kind of hard to get invested in a story when there really are no villains. And that is what happened to Captain Marvel. Granted, the story was crap to begin with, but this only made it worse. The only villains wound up being the mean men who suppressed the awesomeness of Captain Aws- I mean Marvel, while trying to kill the race of beings that has a habit of taking the forms of different races in order to infiltrate their societies in an effort to destroy them as we will see when we come to Secret Invasion. With Captain Marvel making over a billion dollars, everyone knew Avengers Endgame would do well. Very few predicted how well. Nearly $2.8 billion later, and the finale of the Infinity Saga capped a run at theaters that ran over a decade and 22 films, only one of which could be said to have definitely flopped. Endgame was also, however, the coming out party of the MCU. Everyone who saw the movie knows the scene by now. It was the girl power scene in the middle of the finale wherein all the female characters suddenly and inexplicably found themselves in the same place to help Spider-Man. It was later revealed that this scene was ordered from on high at Disney Marvel, and it was to do exactly what everyone took it as, pandering to the female audience. Sadly, the executives at Marvel failed to look at the research following that movie, because if they had, they could have saved themselves billions of dollars. Even women, the demographic Kevin Feige expressly announced he would be pandering to before Endgame's release, hated that scene. Those who answered questions about the movie pointed to that scene specifically, saying it treated women like they were stupid. And it showed that neither Kevin Feige nor Bob Iger understood the movie-going audience. Time and again, research has found that men and women like different types of movies. Women like rom-coms and musicals. Men like superhero, action, and fantasy slash sci-fi movies. That is not to say some men don't like rom-coms and musicals, but they like them as they are made for the target demographic. Women. And it is not to say that some women don't like superhero, action, and sci-fi slash fantasy films, but they like them as they are made for that target demographic. Men. Women would be turned off if their rom-coms were suddenly filled with explosions and gunfights and muscular men in spandex beating each other up. Likewise, men are turned off by masculinized girl bosses unrealistically beating the crap out of guys twice their size. And the same research that found men and women like different things also found out that women hate masculinized girl bosses too. So the girl power scene didn't work for any demographic other than the three weirdos on Twitter that Hollywood studios listened to instead of their actual audience. What followed Endgame is blurred slightly by the Koof. Koof gave everyone in Hollywood an excuse when their dumpster fire of a movie failed to make money. Spider-Man Far From Home was a Sony project and so somewhat immune to the retardation infecting Marvel. Released shortly after Endgame in 2019, it also became a blockbuster as it cruised past the $1 billion mark. Then the lockdown shut down theaters for two years. The next Marvel movie would be Black Widow, a prequel that should have been made five years earlier and released after Civil War. Now, 
Audience decimated by lockdowns and closed theaters were supposed to care about a character they watched die two years prior. Needless to say, this retarded decision did not pay off. The loss was exacerbated by the fact that it was released on Disney Plus the same day it was released to theaters. That decision wound up triggering a lawsuit from Scarlett Johansson because her contract said nothing about Disney Marvel releasing the movie on streaming, thereby lowering its box office profitability and, presumably, Johansson's compensation based on that performance. Black Widow was a ridiculous movie that should have been good. However, like movies Disney Marvel would follow it up with, the film had a stupid story, characters that failed to act intelligently, treated male characters as if they were all retarded, sex swapped the main villain's minion, despite it being obvious that it was a stuntman in the costume when the mask was on, and set the pattern for girl bossery into stone at Disney Marvel. Instead of giving fans of Natasha Romanoff an intelligent spy thriller set in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, they gave them a CGI mess that made little sense from a director who was chosen less for her ability to direct an action movie and more for the fact that she possessed a vagina. That, too, would become a trend. Disney casting directors rather than hiring excellent directors with the requisite experience to handle a big-budget Marvel extravaganza. The Koof excuse used for the poor performance of Black Widow would also be used for Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings. They would also attempt to gaslight the public over whether or not Shang-Chi made money, but the truth came out in earnings reports from Disney months later that yes, the movie did lose money. Shang-Chi was made for the same reason Black Widow was. Pandering. This time, however, it was pandering to the Asian community within the U.S., as well as the massive Chinese box office audience. China, and more specifically the Chinese Communist Party, was getting leery of Hollywood movies and their tendency to propagate Western leftist propaganda that ran contrary to the Communist Party's philosophies and cultural norms. So Hollywood studios began getting pushback from the authorities that governed international films coming into the Chinese theaters. The big brains at Disney Marvel, brains who think like 1950s Southern racists, figured that making a MCU movie with an Asian character that is directed by an Asian director would endear them to the Chinese government. Sadly, Shang-Chi would be a passenger in his own film, much like Scott Lang was in Ant-Man 2. He was moved about by the actions of his female friend, his sister, and his mother all while being goaded into a confrontation with his evil father. It did not help that there was very little comic book accuracy, mainly because the era of Marvel comics from which Shang-Chi and his father come was one in which the characters are considered widely racist by modern standards. Add in a CGI mess and an unlikable main actor, and you have a film that appealed to very few outside of leftist Twitter and professional critics from Access Media. Despite losing money, Disney Marvel almost immediately greenlit a sequel. Because of course it did. Why cut your losses when you can double down and lose even more money? When The Eternals was announced, most people ask themselves, who the f*** are the internals? Even being a comic book collector, I was only vaguely aware of the internals, and mainly due to various members of the group being in issues of the official handbook of the Marvel Universe from the 1980s. Needless to say, the average normie would hear about an Eternals movie and wonder why they should go see it. Then they would hear that Marvel was taking advantage of that fact to insert some social engineering by race, sex, and sexual orientation swapping a number of the characters. Then they would hear the constant drumbeat that this movie is diverse and saving lives, instead of what the movie was about in the media. And yes, the idiots actually claimed their comic book movie was saving lives. And then they would see a trailer with sketchy CGI and standard superhero stuff that they have seen done better in a number of other movies over the previous decade, 
and decide to opt out of spending time and money on what would become the third MCU movie in a row to flop at the box office. By this point, Kevin Feige's ego was writing checks Disney Marvel was having to pony up for. And yes, this was Kevin Feige's ego. Remember, Before Endgame, he promised he was going to do what he was doing with Black Widow, Shang-Chi, and the Eternals. And not in a smart, organic way, but in a blatantly forced way that fans hated and normies ignored. And so, the $236 million movie that needed to hit at least $700 million to break even only managed about $402 million during its global box office run. It officially became the third MCU movie in a row to fail and only the fourth overall. But wait, Kevin Feige and Disney were not done destroying the money printing machine that was the MCU. Later the same year as The Eternals, Sony released the hit of 2021 and the official assassinator of the coup excuse Hollywood had been using up to this point to explain why they were alienating fans and killing themselves. Spider-Man No Way Home grossed nearly $2 billion at the box office, making Eternals look even worse. But remember... That was a Sony project, with Disney having very little to do with its overall production, despite Feige having his name on it as a producer. His next shot at writing the ship would be Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. And it should have been a layup. All he had to do was make sure the people working on it took what was laid down in Doctor Strange, Infinity War, and Endgame, and Spider-Man No Way Home. Instead of doing that, they decided to make Doctor Strange a passenger in his own movie sequel. Wait, that sounds familiar. Oh, right. This was done to Shang-Chi and Ant-Man too. In this case, Doctor Strange would be shoved to the side in favor of turning his sequel into a sequel of WandaVision, a show that aired on Disney+, Plus, Disney's streaming service. I've not touched on it yet because this is the movie where it starts to matter to the mainline MCU storyline, told in the movies. The Falcon and the Winter Soldier, Loki, What If, and Hawkeye were yet to impinge on the stories told in Black Widow or Eternals. The only other movies to be released since Disney Marvel began assigning homework on their streaming service in order to understand movies. Doctor Strange 2 became WandaVision 2. Instead of Doctor Strange driving events, it would be Wanda Maximoff and a new character they would introduce, America Chavez. In the comics, America Chavez comes from an era of Marvel where the American comic book industry decided they wanted to give all of their customers and money to Japan's manga by creating and publishing terrible, but diverse, characters over older and more popular characters. So you wound up with characters like America, Lady Thor, Amadeus Cho, Riri Williams, and Miss Marvel. While Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness made money, it did so on the back of the success of Spider-Man No Way Home, thanks to clever marketing that suggested the movie would continue events of that film instead of being a continuation of the events shown on WandaVision. To exacerbate the situation, the writers decided to use the movie to desecrate favorite characters like Professor X and Reed Richards in the most retarded way possible. The entire movie was a mess, including the terrible and excessive CGI used. Despite this, it did manage to almost reach a billion dollars at the box office on a combined production and marketing budget that was in the neighborhood of $450 million. This means that despite such a good showing at the box office, they only managed about $50 to $100 million in profit. And that is without counting Disney's record of shady accounting where movie budgets are concerned. Next year's Thor Love and Thunder would take the terrible of Doctor Strange and multiply it exponentially. The Thor mini franchise of the MCU is easily the most abused, taking the character of Thor and wrenching him one way and then the other from movie to movie. For Thor to Ragnarok, 
Taika Waititi drove the character off a cliff by turning him into the butt of the incessant jokes sprinkled throughout the movie. Not only that, he destroyed the Asgardians as a people by destroying Asgard and killing Odin. Thor Love and Thunder and Disney Marvel would continue the deconstruction Waititi and Ragnarok started by bringing the man back to continue his work. Thor 4 would see Thor become a passenger in his... Wait, didn't I just say that? Oh yeah, I did. See, this became a theme in the MCU during Phase 4 as Kevin Feige began getting rid of all the old characters who happen to possess a penis and replace them with characters who don't, preferably ones with more melanin. And not only were they replaced, they were denigrated or deconstructed as they were. In Thor's case, he was deconstructed as he once more was set on a mission to find himself in Thor 4. And as anyone who watched videos on the movie, or subjecting themselves to the actual movie knows, he was also denigrated. The story also criminally misused a great character in Gore the Godslayer and the actor who played him, Christian Bale. The CGI was abysmal, writing dreadful, director half-assed, and acting in some quarters less than stellar. Looking at you, Tessa Thompson. Thor, like its predecessor Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness, also brought in a character that is less than popular in the comic books with Lady Thor. That Disney Marvel was smart enough to not try and replace Chris Hemsworth's Thor with Natalie Portman's Lady Thor shows that there is a vestige of intelligence remaining in some dark corner of Disney Marvel. However, the film also so damaged Hemsworth's faith in Disney Marvel that he all but renounced any possibility of him coming back to take up the role in future films. He would later amend that to suggest he might return so long as Taika Waititi was not involved and they got a writer slash director who would be more serious with the character rather than making him the butt of the jokeathon that Marvel has turned him into. On a reported $250 million production budget that would require the film to hit somewhere in the $750 million range to break even with marketing included, Thor Love and Thunder only managed to hit $760.9 million. Rumors out of Marvel during and after the production hinted that the budget was much higher due to reshoots and various other issues. What followed was perhaps the most tragic of the post-Endgame MCU projects in Black Panther Wakanda Forever. By this point, Chadwick Boseman had been dead from colon cancer for two years. Instead of recasting the role of T'Challa, something Boseman's family was fine with and thought Chadwick would have wanted done, Disney Marvel decided to run with what had happened in Marvel Comics, namely making Churi the Black Panther. You know, Churi, the 5'5", five 110-pound five, chick who will now be throwing around guys two or three times her size. It sucked in the comics, and it was even worse in the movie. But they didn't stop there. Who would the villain be in this stunning and brave flick? Namor. Or rather, Namor. And at no point is the moniker the Submariner used. Why? Because Disney Marvel do not completely own the rights to Namor and all of his characteristics, one of them being his superhero name, the Submariner. To compound the mistake of using a character you don't completely own, they decided to turn the rather alien-looking, faintly Japanese-ish Atlantean into a Mexican who could have used a little more time in the gym before shooting started. With a thick Mexican accent, Tenoch Huerta Mejia attempted to play Namor, and was nothing short of laughable. The story did not help. Pitting landlocked Wakanda against deep sea Atlantis made perfect sense. At least it did to Disney. And Marvel. And Ryan Coogler, the director. But oh wait, it wasn't Atlantis. Probably because they don't have the rights to that either. Instead, Namor was king of Talokan. 
Some Aztec-looking underwater bullshit dreamt up by the creatively bankrupt clowns at Disney Marvel. On top of that, Disney Marvel decided to use the movie to introduce a character they already were planning a Disney Plus series for. Young female tech genius Riri Williams. Riri is a character most figured Kevin Feige was planning to take up Iron Man's mantle for the continuation of the Avengers in coming years. The problem? Riri Williams is not a popular character, even in the comic books. Her origin story reads like that of a villain, and the writing for her is typical of what gets sharded out by Marvel Comics these days. Despite all of that, Black Panther 2 managed to glom on to some of the sympathy from the death of Chadwick Boseman and the echoes of the excitement from the first Black Panther movie to haul in at almost $860 million on a combined production and marketing budget of around $375 to $400 million. It also managed an Oscar for Best Costume Design and a nomination for Angela Bassett, who played Queen Ramonda. Three months later, and Disney Marvel would be back to their losing ways with Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantumania. Ant-Man 3 would continue the trend started in Ant-Man 2, namely sidelining Scott Lang's Ant-Man for the stunning and brave female characters around him. This time, it would be his obnoxious daughter Cassie, now somehow grown into a tech genius and law-breaking activist, his girlfriend Hope, now his sort of partner as the Wasp, her mom, now back from the Quantum Realm, and Gentora, freedom fighter rebelling against the antagonist. The film was a CGI mess. The story was borderline retard. Actually, not borderline. It went full retard. And you never go full retard. The film was supposed to be the coming out party for the villain of the movie and the villain for Disney Marvel going forward as they started Phase 5 and the Multiverse Saga. Kang the Conqueror, played by Jonathan Majors. Yes, that Jonathan Majors. Mind you, Kang wasn't even that good a character in the comic books, and he is even worse when handled by Bob Iger's minion, Kevin Feige, and the folks at Disney Marvel. At the time Ant-Man 3 came out, Kang had already been killed in Season 1 of Loki by female Loki. So what do you suppose would happen in Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania given the absolute window lickers Disney is allowing to write and direct MCU movies for them these days? Yeah, he gets killed again. Mind you, this is supposed to be the big bad for Phases 5 and 6 of the MCU and he has now been killed twice rather easily. Does anybody remember how Thanos was built up? Barely seen, moving in the shadows through intermediaries and lackeys, trying to achieve his evil plan without anyone the wiser. How many films into the Infinity Saga were we before Thanos was on screen for an extended period of time? And there we were, at the beginning of the Multiverse Saga, wherein Kang the Conqueror would be the one everyone should be worried about, and he turns out to be a clown who has been killed in two out of two appearances. Needless to say, Ant-Man 3 bombed. A few months after Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania, James Gunn's final work for Disney Marvel before pissing off to DC as that studio's head came out. Guardians of the Galaxy 3 was anticipated by fans because it looked like it could be the last decent MCU movie for a long time, barring the possibility of Deadpool 3 getting back to the original movie's style. And it largely lived up to that expectation. While not a perfect movie, Guardians 3 was a good send-off for the team of misfit heroes that largely tied up story arcs to good effect. The story was engaging, and the villain in the High Evolutionary wound up being one of the best in MCU history. While not as good as the original film, Guardians 3 did what it needed to do, and actually made money while doing it. And that was largely because, unlike most of the directors of Phases 4 and 5 thus far, James Gunn is an established director with a long history of making quality films, especially within the MCU. 
Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania was the second MCU movie that assigned homework to understand some of what was going on. Homework that required one to access the MCU series being pumped out to feed the need of Disney+, Plus, Disney's new streaming service. While you could watch Ant-Man 3 without having to watch Loki, having seen the show helps. You could not, however, skip WandaVision and understand most of what was going on in Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness. From Ant-Man 3 on, homework became the norm, however. WandaVision, The Falcon and the Winter Soldier, Loki, What If, Hawkeye, Moon Knight, Miss Marvel, She-Hulk Attorney at Law, Secret Invasion, and Echo were shot out onto streaming, most of them somewhere between meh and bad. A few, however, were absolute dog And the deeper we got into Phase 5 of the MCU on streaming, the worse it got. One Division started out with promise, using an interesting premise and unique filmmaking styles to convey the story of Wanda trying to cope with the loss of Vision in the Infinity War. By the end, it wound up being a girl boss CGI fight that devolved into typical MCU crap. The Falcon and the Winter Soldier, beyond an entirely unnecessarily unwieldy title, not only botched the handover of the shield of Captain America, but ruined not one but three decent characters, all while extolling the virtues of a terrorist organization. It was a preachy, morally relativistic mess that was embarrassing. Loki, like WandaVision, started out with a good idea. And then the first episode happened. They took one of the best villains of the MCU and cucked the ever-living out of him. Loki went from being the amoral trickster god of the Norse to a dude who was continually shat on, and season two only got worse. What If is a series that could be f***ing awesome if we were not smack dab in the middle of the deconstruction of the MCU by the idiots running Marvel. Like everything else post-Endgame, What If has also gotten the MCU treatment. Instead of exploring some of the cool alternate history sort of questions the What If comic books took up, many of the episodes are facile and vapid. Hawkeye and Moon Knight both took cool characters that are classic Avengers members with long histories in the comics and completely deconstructed and cucked them in favor of elevating characters called not Hawkeye and not Moon Knight. And I will give one guess to what demographic these not characters don't come from. Which is a shame, because Moon Knight especially has a vast potential, given he is basically Marvel's version of Batman. Miss Marvel is a show that should never have been. I am on record as saying Iman Villani is too good for Disney Marvel. She is a grounded and sweet person who manages to make that come through on film. However, she is locked into playing a character that was not even popular or good in the comics, and that has only gotten worse now that the hacks at Disney Marvel have brought her to the MCU. Miss Marvel was a show that almost nobody watched except the fawning access media, the activists, and YouTubers who had their bank accounts swell by making videos about how bad the show was. And things only got worse with She-Hulk attorney at law. Disney Marvel took one of the all-time great female characters who also happens to be wildly popular with the male readership of Marvel Comics and turned her show into the girl bossiest of girl boss shows with some of the most cringe writing ever conceived by YouTubers joking about what idiocy the MCU will vomit out next, including making the audience of the MCU the villains of the show none of which was helped by the fact that the people, mostly of the female variety, working on the show had no idea what they were doing, and proud to announce that fact that they had never read a single She-Hole comic book. Nearly a year later, the worst and most deconstructing mess ever conceived by the talentless voids of creativity hired by Kevin Feige arrived to a rousing marketing campaign by Disney Marvel. 
Secret Invasion was supposed to be a semi-spy thriller show in the vein of Captain America Winter Soldier, wherein the Skrulls try to take over the world. In the comic books, this was a pretty good story arc. On Disney+, Plus, it was an excuse to completely destroy the character of Nick Fury in every way possible, while also creating the next Supergirl boss. Logical consistency, intelligent world building, compatible back history development, and creative and compelling storytelling all went out the window as Kyle Bradstreet took one of the coolest characters in the MCU and completed his public cucking that began in Captain Marvel. By the end, Nick Fury was a broken down old man kissing his squirrel wife as they piss off to the Sabre space station while the world goes to hell in a handbasket, largely because he and Captain Marvel couldn't be bothered to find the squirrels a planet in the three or four decades between the events in Captain Marvel and Secret Invasion. Something that becomes even dumber when the Marvels movie rolls around. And finally, Echo. Who the f*** is Echo, you ask? Good question. If you did not watch the deconstruction of Hawkeye in that series, you would have no idea. Echo is the walking definition of DEI hiring. Echo is a female, Native American, deaf, amputee, who was one of the main villains of Hawkeye. For reasons that probably have to do with sucking on the ESG investment tee of BlackRock and Vanguard, Disney almost immediately greenlit a spin-off show about Echo, despite Hawkeye not exactly blowing the doors off with their viewership numbers. It made shows like Miss Marvel look well thought out and creatively innovative by comparison. It was a show that was so bad, Disney Marvel tried to can it, never to be seen. For reasons that probably have to do with legal contracts, they couldn't. And it promptly cratered on D+. That is the extent of the imbecility of what streaming has meant for the MCU. It should have been an opportunity for Disney Marvel to entice subscribers to their streaming service by providing Marvel content. Alas. That content started out meh-ish and has quickly fallen off a cliff. Not only that, the idiots running Disney Marvel have decided to interweave the series on Disney Plus with the MCU movies, rather than having them be adjuncts to the movies. In other words, it has become homework to watch their MCU movies released in theaters. Doctor Strange 2 was really the first of them that was related to the D-plus fair much of the storyline depending on one of the shows that was on D+. From here on out, there is no Disney movie that has been released or that is on the schedule that does not require Disney Plus homework to be completed. This became apparent when The Marvels was released. The supposed sequel to Captain Marvel, The Marvels required you to not only have seen the first movie, Captain Marvel, but also watch Miss Marvel, WandaVision, and Secret Invasion in order to understand much of what was going on in the movie overall and in the context of the larger MCU. It was a terrible movie that Disney knew was going to be terrible because they reshot the hell out of it and then cut it down to the barest minimum of runtime, winding up only being about 88 minutes of actual movie time. And if you saw the trailer for it, you saw the movie. Every single story beat in the movie was spoiled by the trailer, including how the villain wound up dying. For my complete thoughts on the mess, see my review of the Marvels. We are now about four months away from Deadpool and Wolverine, aka Deadpool 3. And those in charge of Disney Marvel know this might be their last chance to salvage the MCU. No other movie that Marvel has announced for the next three plus years has any hope of being good, given the rumors out of the various projects. Captain America Brave New World has gone into extensive reshoots that rumors out of Disney say is all but reshooting the entire film. Test screenings of the movie, as shot, were dismal. The audiences loathing it as rumors say the script went hard into the leftist Hollywood political agenda 
including January 6th allegories. Thunderbolts, a group nobody outside of hardcore comic book fans know about, plans to gather the low-key, borderline ineffectual villains from Captain America Winter Soldier, Ant-Man and the Wasp, the Falcon and the Winter Soldier, Black Widow, and Black Panther Wakanda Forever in a knockoff, Marvel version of the Suicide Squad. And because those characters are the ones starring in the film, you will be required to have already watched at least four previous MCU films and one Disney Plus show. All rumors out of the Fantastic Four indicate it will be a complete show. For years, we have gotten various casting rumors until recently Disney Marvel finally announced a cast that was largely inoffensive, but not great. I don't know why Hollywood wants to stick Pedro Pascal in everything, but he is a terrible choice for Reed Richards. Not only is he far too old, but he does not have the on-screen presence to pull off a Reed Richards credibly. Then there are the repeated problems they have had with the script and the director carousel the movie has been in. Given the loss of Jonathan Major's Kang the Conqueror as the big bad of the MCU's multiverse saga, it is almost a certainty they will try to force Doctor Doom into that role, probably screwing up both him and the Fantastic Four in the process. The less said about the Mahershala Ali Blade remake, the better. Ali has been less than thrilled with how the project has gone, and the idiots in charge of it neither know what they are doing vis-a-vis Blade, nor are able to rein in their ideological impulses with regards to the script. This is another film that has had so many script and writer changes, directors, film writing changes, and the story element changes, that there is little hope a decent Blade movie will emerge in 2025. Which is ridiculous. They got an Oscar-winning actor to sign on as Blade and then proceeded to completely f*** up every single step thereafter, including coming up with a script wherein Blade would have played fourth fiddle at best as Blade's daughter and two other stunning and brave female characters handed out life lessons. Yes, that was actually the leaked script story they were originally going with and that Mahershala Ali was publicly protesting about. Then there are the two Avengers films planned for 2026 and 2027 respectively, neither of which will be released at the rate the MCU is going. Disney Marvel does not have an Avengers team anyone wants to see at this point. Bob Iger has sat back and allowed and or participated in the wholesale destruction of the most lucrative movie franchise in the history of film. Roughly 25 films over a decade's time that raked in over 22 billion. From Iron Man to Spider-Man Far From Home and its sequel Spider-Man No Way Home, the MCU owned the box office. Other studios fled from dates claimed by Disney Marvel, not wanting their movies to be swallowed up by the behemoth that was the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Five of the top 20 highest grossing films of all time are MCU films, with four of the top 10 being from Disney Marvel. How did it go wrong? Bob Iger, in his retardedness, backed Kevin Feige over Ike Perlmutter when Perlmutter tried to axe Feige. And as soon as the Perlmutter regime films worked their way out of the box office and the Feige-only movies arrived, the quality began falling. Feige all but announced he was going to undo the entire corporate purpose for Disney buying Marvel in the first place, namely to tap into the boys' and men's toy and entertainment markets. Disney could not do it in-house. They did not have the creativity, which is why they bought Marvel and Lucasfilm in the first place. I have already covered Lucasfilm in part three of Is Bob Iger Retarded? Bob Iger sat back and applauded Kevin Feige as Feige publicly vowed to MCU the MCU. And when the results began rolling in with less than thrilling box office receipts, Did Bob Iger do 
anything. No. He allowed Kevin Feige to plow full steam ahead as the MCU crashed into Mount Woke to the tune of billions of dollars lost at the box office and billions more lost on Disney+. Plus. Kevin Feige single-handedly killed the superhero genre, a genre that had been roaring into theaters every summer for nearly a decade and coming away with coffers fat with cash. What could Bob Iger have done? I have gone over that in previously mentioned Marvel videos, but what should have happened was Kevin Feige and all of his minions getting the boot by the end of 2021. When that didn't happen and a couple of films saw modest profits in the form of Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness and Guardians of the Galaxy 3, then they should definitely have been canned following the Marvels. And that is just on the movie side of things. When taking into account the streaming fare shat out by Disney Marvel, She-Hulk Attorney at Law should have spelled their doom. That shows like Echo and Agatha have been greenlit, made, sat on a shelf, and then dumped all at once on Disney Plus should have proven Feige's inability to judge quality entertainment, never mind make it. Especially quality Marvel entertainment. That all of them are still ensconced at Marvel merely shows that Bob Iger is either retarded or intentionally killing the Golden Goose. The desperation of Bob Iger at this point is merely his just desserts. And he and the rest of the head honchos at Disney are desperate. They are facing parent revolts over Disney's not-so-secret gay agenda being foist on toddlers, both at their parks and in their entertainment media. They are facing fan revolts over the subversion and deconstruction of once-mighty franchises beloved by generations of fans. And now, because of all of that, they are facing shareholder revolts over diving stock prices in the form of Nelson Peltz. They are so worried over that last one that they are paying to air commercials begging Disney stockholders to vote for Iger's slate of board candidates rather than having Nelson Peltz have seats, thereby introducing an element that is not completely under Iger's control into the Disney process. In all of the years I have been paying attention to Wall Street in my dilettante fashion, I have never seen a company's leadership air commercials begging the stockholders to back their plays vis-a-vis board of trustees elections. And if Bob Iger were not retarded, none of this would be necessary. Why? Because only an idiot, a retard, or a bad actor would sit by for four years and allow underlings at subsidiaries to destroy said subsidiaries that massive amounts of good money was paid out in order to acquire. Pixar, Lucasfilm, Marvel, 21st Century Fox. Billions of dollars that initially seemed to be paying off. Then, about seven or eight years ago, that stopped being the case. Disney began falling apart. And instead of getting rid of the people making the mistakes, Bob Iger doubled and tripled down. Why? Well, that is the question that seems to keep popping up. At first, one could guess incompetence. But that explanation begins to ring hollow after a few years, and the same mistakes keep being made, with the same playbook being used while said mistakes are unfolding. Given the era we are in, One could then point to BlackRock and Vanguard, guessing that the ESG money would cover things going so terribly wrong. But again, that begins ringing hollow after so long with such massive losses. Yes, the head of BlackRock is on tape saying he wanted to quote-unquote force behaviors via his control of trillions in investment money. But even asset managers with trillions in assets begin to worry when what they invest in begins to see as big a downturn as Disney and other Hollywood studios have seen. So what is left? We are left with the binary choice of those in charge either being malicious enough to kill their own companies over ideology, which is completely within the realm of possibility, or them being massively retarded. And of course, it could always be both. And Bob Iger would have to be the biggest retard of them all. 
Not only has Disney seen one of the biggest declines of them all, but they have executed a corporate strategy to do one thing, find a way into a market they do not do well in, and then allow the heads of the subsidiaries that are supposed to fix that to do the complete f***ing opposite. And in the process of doing so, allowed ever more activists into the company at all levels, thereby accelerating the process of destruction. By this point, anyone with a modicum of intelligence or concern for the health of their company would have begun a Twitter-style purge. That, however, is not on the horizon, despite the large layoffs all Hollywood studios are undertaking, Disney included. Marvel is perhaps the most important example of the mess Bob Iger has allowed to fester through his incompetence and mental retardation. Not the worst, but the most significant. Disney Marvel was actually doing well. Better than well. It was a literal printing press of cash for Disney from before they bought it until the release of Avengers Endgame. Bob Iger had to have seen or been made aware of Kevin Feige's intent to completely reverse course on the purpose Iger had for buying Marvel in the first place. And the manner in which Feige went about doing it was plain to all who were paying attention. Yet nothing was done. Well, other than lip service by the retard in chief who would earnestly tell entertainment media outlets that he would be reining in the ideology and begin focusing Disney on quality rather than quantity. Alas, despite Bob Iger promising this for three years running, the dreck still gets churned out in mass quantities. And the audiences have had more than enough to simply walk away. That is all I have for this installment of Is Bob Iger Retarded? If you like what I do here, please hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, share the video, and comment down below. Tune in next time as we tackle my least familiar sector of Disney, the parks. For years I've been hearing the discontent from parents about the Disney parks, which leads me to believe they too are a mess. I will likely add the cruise lines into that, but they are one of the few Disney things that is doing well these days and seems to be semi-healthy. Until then... Choose.